Hello and welcome to Ukraine This Week with me, Don Arleth. I'm really excited to bring you the most relevant developments from Russia's war in Ukraine, highlight the heroes and great thinkers, and provide you deeper insight about the topics that really matter. Let this be your one-stop shop for spotlighting Ukraine's struggle to determine its own future and tracking the progress on the political and proverbial battlefield. Now, let's get started. In a significant development, the European Union has prepared the draft framework of accession talks for Ukraine and Moldova, signaling a pivotal moment in the relationship between the EU and these Eastern European nations. This development comes amidst ongoing disputes and political challenges within the region, but highlights the EU's commitment in supporting its neighbors. On March 12, the European Commission presented the Council of the European Union with proposals for the draft negotiation framework for Ukraine and Moldova. These frameworks are based on previous enlargements and ongoing negotiations, integrating revised methodology and EU legislative developments. Yesterday, the negotiating framework was approved. Therefore, this year we moved to the pre-final phase of acquiring EU membership, namely the accession negotiations. The EU Council will now internally discuss and must approve these drafts before the first intergovernmental conference with each country, marking the formal start of negotiations. There is speculation that approval may be delayed until after the June European Parliament elections. Ursula von der Leyen, seeking re-election, does not want to rock the boat right ahead of the crucial vote. Additionally, especially as the vote is followed by the start of Hungarian presidency of the EU Council, the 27 member states may postpone the opening of talks with Kiev. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Also this week, in a significant military reshuffle, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has appointed Colonel General Alexander Sirsky as the new commander-in-chief of the armed forces, replacing General Valery Zaluzhny. This move comes at a critical juncture as Ukraine continues to navigate through the complexities of the ongoing war with Russia. The replacement of Zaluzhny, who oversaw key victories against Russian forces and was highly regarded by the public, has stirred reactions across Ukraine. Late last year, Zaluzhny enjoyed a public trust rating of over 90 percent, significantly higher than Zelensky's 77 percent. This discrepancy in popularity points led to Zaluzhny's significant standing among Ukrainians. Today, I approved the candidacy of our country's ambassador to the United Kingdom. General Valery Zelunshi spoke to me specifically about pursuing a diplomatic direction. The decision to shift Zaluzhny to a diplomatic role in the UK and bring in Sirsky, known for his tactical acumen and experience on the front lines, reflects the Ukrainian government's strategic reorientation in both military and diplomatic arenas. Under Sirsky's command, Ukrainian forces achieved significant victories, including the successful defense of Kyiv and a rapid counteroffensive that reclaimed territories near Kharkiv. However, Sirsky's leadership has not been without controversy. His tactics, particularly during the prolonged and devastating battle for Bakhmut, have been criticized by some within the Ukrainian military for resulting in high casualties. Armed groups identifying themselves as Russian citizens, opposed to the Kremlin, launched cross-border attacks into Western Russia from Ukraine on March 12th. These groups, notably the Freedom of Russia Legion, claimed responsibility for the incursions, claiming that they had seized control of Tiotkino, a village in Russia's Kursk region bordering Ukraine. Moscow, however, rejects this claim, stating that it repelled the attacks. The attacks come just days before a presidential election in Russia, adding tension to an already volatile region over two years since Moscow's full-scale invasion of Ukraine began. The Freedom of Russia Legion have made clear references to the election in a video they posted on the day of the incursion. We want to give your children a normal and civilized future, without sanctions, without repressions, without elections where you don't have a choice, without rhetoric about what's important, but with important values. And most importantly, without a war, Vladimir Putin has usurped power over 20 years. 
The Legion, along with the Russian Volunteer Corps and the Siberian Battalion, claim to have destroyed the Russian armored personnel carrier during their operations, which are said to aim at diverting Russian military resources and attention, thereby easing the offensive pressure on Ukrainian forces in eastern Ukraine. The Freedom of Russia Legion and the Russian Volunteer Corps have previously claimed responsibility for similar cross-border raids. The following day, Ukraine launched a sweeping drone attack on Russian regions, causing a fire at Rosneft's biggest oil refinery. The day after seriously damaging Lukoil's refinery, a Ukrainian drone attacked the Ryazan oil refinery, Russia's seventh largest, 180 kilometers from Moscow. The situation underscores the complex dynamics of the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine, especially in the context of political events like the Russian presidential election, regardless of how insignificant the actual vote may be. In another grim escalation of violence, Russian missile attacks have devastated communities in Ukraine, claiming the lives and causing widespread dis destruction. The cities of Krivirig, located in Dnipropetrovsk Oblast, as well as the port city of Odessa, bore the brunt of these attacks, with casualties mounting in both cases. Odessa saw the largest Russian attack on the city since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The missile strike in Krivi Rich targeted a residential area, obliterating approximately 300 flats within a multi-story block and displacing countless residents. A Russian missile slammed into two apartment buildings Tuesday, killing five people and injuring over 40 more, with rescue teams sifting through rubble late into the night in a search for survivors. In a similar vein, the Black Sea port city of Odessa became the scene of one of Moscow's deadliest attacks in recent weeks on Friday. A Russian ballistic missile attack on civilian infrastructure claimed at least 20 lives and inflicted injuries on more than several dozen. The attack in Odessa also led to the destruction of a three-story recreational facility, damaging at least 10 private houses, a low-pressure gas pipeline and rescue vehicles, as detailed by the Southern Military Command. Rescue efforts faced challenges as fires broke out, complicating the task of clearing the rubble and aiding the affected. In response to the tragedy, the community has rallied, with residents queuing at medical centers to donate blood for the injured. The city declared Saturday a day of mourning, underscoring the profound loss and solidarity among the populace in the face of adversity. Odessa, a vital Ukrainian port, has been under constant threat, especially after Russia withdrew from a UN brokered deal facilitating safe passage for Ukrainian grain shipments via the Black Sea. And now let's peer at the map. Let's take a look, a closer look at the front lines in eastern Ukraine. Uh, of course, down in the south near Kherson, the uh, situation continues to be difficult as uh, Ukrainians have a small foothold near Krynki across the Dnipro River on the left bank. Uh, but if we go to Donetsk, the biggest story we've heard out of there of, as of late is, of course, the overrunning of Avdivka by Russian troops. Uh, Russian troops have really pushed well past the city, as you can see, and they're continuing their push to the west. Now, it is important to note that artillery is mainly lacking in Ukraine. Um, artillery is, uh, the lack of ammunition in Ukraine is largely a result of what we've seen uh, by these Russian attacks, Russians throwing huge amounts of meat on the front lines there. Avdivka was under Ukrainian control uh, all throughout the war ever since 2014 and was really a stronghold. It is very unfortunate to see that it has been broken through. Uh, Kupiansk, of course, they continue to push into uh, the northeast of the city uh, near Sinkivka, getting ever closer to the city of Kupiansk. There's reports of large amounts of uh, heavy military equipment in that area. Uh, Russians have been pushing on Kupiansk for months and months now, ever since Ukrainians retook it uh, back in the fall of 2022, uh, but with limited, limited um, advances there. Uh, now we can see the region of uh, Belgorod, Kharkiv. Uh, we have reports of the Russian foreign legions entering those areas in Belgorod and in the Kursk region, uh, of course, taking at least one small village in the Belgorod region. Um, as so they claimed, uh, wreaking havoc on Russian forces within their own country. Now, um, we also see that, that uh, the village here of Tiotkino, and that is in the Kursk region, uh, that is the village that I was just talking about, the one claimed to have been taken by these 
Russian freedom fighters, if you will. We know that they uh, are given assistance and right of passage by the Ukrainian government, uh, but as they claim, they are Russian citizens fighting to liberate Russia from Vladimir Putin and his criminal regime. Now it's time to move away from the map and look at the war in Ukraine through a journalist's lens. And for that, now I'm joined by my friend, war correspondent, journalist, and writer, currently based in Kherson, Zarina Zabrisky. Zarina, let's see if we can. Oh, we've lost her. Okay, so now we're going to uh, take a real quick break. We'll be right back. Hopefully, we'll have Zarina. On March 16, 2014, a pivotal moment in recent history unfolded as Crimea was officially, albeit illegally, annexed by the Russian Federation following a controversial and largely unrecognized referendum. This event from 10 years ago set in motion a series of events that continue to affect international relations and regional stability until this day. And now, joining me to discuss the situation in Crimea is a good friend of ours here on TVP World, that is Kira Rudik, a Ukrainian MP. Kira, thank you very much for joining us today on Ukraine This Week. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Absolutely. Now, as we discuss uh, the situation in Crimea, we all know that it's... Uh, oh, actually, before I get started, uh, let's go ahead and see this uh, quick piece of material that we've prepared for you. The illegal annexation came after a period of intense political turmoil in Ukraine, culminating in the ousting of President Viktor Yanukovych in February of 2014. In the wake of this political vacuum, unmarked troops called Little Green Men, later acknowledged by Russia as its own soldiers, seized key installations across the Crimean Peninsula. The referendum that followed was hastily organized and widely criticized by the international community for its lack of legitimacy and alleged breaches of both Ukrainian law and international norms. The result, which indicated overwhelming support for joining Russia, was met with immediate condemnation from Western governments and several international bodies. They argued that the vote was conducted under duress without proper international oversight and in a context of significant military presence. The United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution affirming Ukraine's territorial integrity and recognizing the Crimea region as part of Ukraine. In the years following the annexation, the international community has remained divided. Western sanctions were imposed on Russia, targeting its financial, energy and defense sectors, as well as individual sanctions against Russian officials directly involved in the annexation process. Russia, on the other hand, has continued to integrate Crimea into its federal structure, investing heavily in infrastructure and military assets on the peninsula. 
Furthermore, the annexation has heightened military tensions in the region, contributing to the ongoing conflict in eastern Ukraine, where separatist movements, allegedly supported by Russia, have led to a protracted and bloody conflict. The annexation of Crimea also set a precedent for Russia's foreign policy approach towards its neighbors, underscoring the Kremlin's willingness to use military force to achieve its geopolitical objectives. As we reflect on the annexation of Crimea, its implications are far-reaching, affecting not just Ukraine and Russia, but the broader international order. It has raised fundamental questions about territorial sovereignty, the rule of law, and the mechanisms at the disposal of the international community to respond to such crises. Now, Kira, it's been now more than 10 years of uh, legal Russian annexation of Crimea. And as we uh, well mark this sad event, um, in your opinion, has the Crimea of 10 years ago, uh, when it was part of Ukraine, ha has it been erased by Russia as we see it now? We really hope not. And we know that there are many people who are still fighting for Ukraine inside Crimea. And the proof of that is that Russia constantly is arresting more and more people whom they suspect in uh, working for Ukraine and working with Ukraine. We know that Crimea is Ukraine and we will never give up on the goal to return it back to Ukraine and to free people who are right now there, uh, including uh, all illegally moved people, but also uh, including all political prisoners, that Russia is increasing their numbers every single day. You know, for us, Crimea is a painful matter because it was the first attempt of Russia to try out the response of the West. And it was the first sign of impunity for Putin when there were some sanctions. But actually, he remained a handshakeable president with all the Western leaders. And though the matter of Crimea was raising up by uh, some of the allies, uh, it still did not uh, push Russia back harder and harder. And it led to the fact that Russia gathered more forces, more troops, and attacked us in 2022. Right. And uh, many people falsely conceive this as such a a long uh, drug out process, right? That this war has been going on for so long that there is really no end in sight. Uh, but based on the unity that we're seeing today, at least from a political perspective, um, is this situation solvable in the upcoming, in, in the near term? Well, we are the living proof that it is solvable. And we are the living proof that we can and will win the war and restore our um, sovereignty and territorial integrity. What we need is very clear. We never hid it from anyone. We need a proper amount of weapons so we can fight Russia and we will not have to face them empty handed. The issue that we are facing right now is not an um, inability for us to gather enough forces or not a la like lack of the willingness to fight. We have all of that. What we need is weapons, modern weapons, with the proper amounts. As of right now, many of the political promises that have been made by our friends and allies did not become weapons in hands of Ukrainian soldiers. And it is incre incredibly ex upsetting for us, but also it calls for us to work closer and harder with our allies to make sure that European capacity in uh, production of their weapons and supplies is raising. Because what we have seen and what Crimea taught us is Russia would not stop unless they are stopped. And we are willing to do that so the war wouldn't uh, be held in, uh, in, and fought in one of the uh, other European countries. And now, finally, uh, my last question. You know, what is an acceptable future for Ukraine? Is there no other alternative to 100% uh, returning Ukraine under, uh, I mean, uh, Crimea under Ukrainian control? Or is there potentially another solution um, involving Crimea? When we are talking about any solution other than returning Crimea to Ukraine, uh, it will imply that the precedent will be created, another dangerous precedent, that in 21st century, one country can annex the territory of another one, commit all kinds of the war crimes, and then get away with it. 
and then say, well, okay, and we found like a third solution. It will mean that the international law does not work and may not work in certain cases if they are found applicable. And it will create so many issues throughout the world uh, where the dictatorships and authoritarian regimes would look at it and say, well, okay, then we can do that as well. We will use the force to conduct sham referendum, and then we will annex the territories, we will uh, say it's our territories, and then when the world will get tired, we will say, well, let's try and find some third solution. No, right. we do not trust Russia, and uh, we didn't do anything wrong. We are a sovereign country with the free people who are willing to fight for their freedom. So we want the things as they were when uh, Ukraine declared its in independence, and the whole world accepted this independence and our borders. When those borders were interrupted and uh, uh, absolute, was absolute disgrace by Russia, there should have been an immediate response from the West. And what is happening right now is the result of the lack of uh, this response. So right now we are saying, no, it stops now. Nothing that, uh, no pieces of our land that we are giving to Russia because we know that then they will return. Okay, Kira Rudik, Ukrainian MP, thank you very much for joining us here today on the program. Thank you and glory to Ukraine. Stop Ukraine. Uh, as the... Uh, as of the morning of March 15, 2024, polling stations across Russia opened their doors, marking the beginning of a three-day voting period in the presidential election. The outcome appears to be predetermined with widespread expectations that Vladimir Putin will secure the presidency for a fifth term, raising questions about the electoral process's transparency and, of course, its competitiveness. Incumbent Vladimir Putin faces three contenders, Nikolai Karinitov from the Communist Party, Leonid Slutsky of the Liberal Democratic Party, and Vladislav Davankov from the New People Party. However, none of these candidates have publicly condemned the war in Ukraine or directly criticized Putin, leading to skepticism about the genuine competitiveness of the race. The Central Electoral Commission has excluded independent candidates critical of the war in Putin's administration, citing registration issues. This has eliminated voices like Ekaterina Dudzova, a journalist, and Boris Nadezhdin, a politician from the electoral contest, both of whom have advocated for ending the war in Ukraine. The spotlight remains firmly on Putin, who has engaged in extensive nationwide campaigning under the guise of official presidential duties, rather than explicitly electoral activities. This strategy underscores an attempt to maintain a facade of normalcy and uncontested leadership, sidestepping the electoral debate on pressing national issues. The Kremlin's primary objective for this election appears to be achieving a high voter turnout with an aim for 70 to 80 percent of the electorate, of which a significant majority is expected to support Putin. Efforts to mobilize state employees and the application of administrative resources to ensure participation underscore the state's influence over the electoral process. The introduction of electronic voting in 29 regions represents a significant change. The authorities have encouraged early electronic voting, especially among state employees, to secure the desired electoral results. In the occupied territories of Ukraine, including the regions of Zaporizhia, Kherson, Donetsk and Luhansk, as well as annexed Crimea, the Russian government has aggressively pushed for participation in the presidential election. This move has been widely condemned by the international community as a violation of international law and an attempt to legitimize the illegal annexation of these territories. <laughs> And now here to discuss these so-called elections is my guest, Harry Bolton, uh, international security expert. Hello, sir, and thank you for joining us on Ukraine this week. Good morning. Now, uh, I'd like to start off with, the, uh, as I mentioned, the so-called Russian elections. Well, they're upon us so yet again. I think we all know who will win. Uh, the only so-called international observers that we'll see in this election will likely be the stooges that we've seen in previous elections. Uh, the OSCE, for instance, plays a vital role in observing elections amongst its member states. Um, and from that perspective, how can we view these Russian elections and especially their credibility? Well, I, I don't think President Putin cares a jot what you think or I think. Uh, or indeed what the Ukrainian people think regarding their leg legitimacy, or, whether it, or the OSCE for that matter. Um, what is important for President Putin is that he is able to present to his country 
um, although most of his country will see through it, but be able to present some sort of legitimacy to support his campaign in Ukraine and support his ongoing uh, authoritarian rule of uh, the Russian Federation. Now, that's what matters to him. So we have to understand that. And you know, I think we all recognise that these elections are absolutely designed to ensure that there's going to be around about, as, as your lead-in said, 70 to 80 percent turnout, of which I think we can expect about 70 to 75 percent to vote for Putin, probably a far greater proportion in the occupied areas. And of course, I think your previous speaker mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the situation in those occupied areas to an extent and never accepting that they, they're under Russian rule. I would uh, That's ob obviously the, the position to take. Um, but right at the very beginning, it was, it was clear, before the invasion started, it was clear that there were going to be a number of phases to this operation. And one of those phases was going to be, once they'd occupied areas, to move the administration into Russian hands. And as they did that, and as the sort of the, the civilian population in those areas understood what was happening, uh, then you know, and, and plus the conflict, of course, and the dangers associated with that, the people who would vote against Putin have left those areas. So I think we can see a very high turnout. We can see we'll see a very high uh, vote for Putin. Uh, that will be presented to the Russian people as legitimacy for the ongoing campaign. Um, what we've got to do in the West here is absolutely no way except that. Uh, you know, he is going to present it in one way. We need to present it in the correct way. And the problem for the OSCE, you, who you mentioned, um, is that Russia sits at the table there. It is the only intergovernmental security organisation in the world. Uh, the UN is not primarily a security organisation, at which you've got all the EU member states, you've got the United States, and you've got the Russian Federation, as well as a whole range of others, sat at the same table. And indeed, ironically, um, part of the reason the OSCE was set up was, as, as if you like, the, the monitor, the guardian of the Helsinki Final Act, drafted by then the Soviet Union, guaranteeing territorial integrity for all former Soviet and CIS states. Um, it's an irony, but uh, but there we are. But it's very important that the OSC does not exclude Russia from that table. So it's it's in a very difficult situation at the moment, the OSC. Right, and it's uh, essentially paralyzed by uh, Russia and Belarus. Um, it is. Opposition candidates we have, right? Um, could that, that could legitimately challenge Putin, never find themselves on the ballot, or well, usually they're, they find themselves six feet underground. Um, the results of the preliminary election polls often match the official election results, which we, which we know is uh, impossible. So, so what's the consensus? In your opinion, do you think that Russians really go to the polls and, and, and uh, vote for Vladimir Putin? Do you think that it's possible that the actual official results are never really revealed? It's just more like a, uh, a poll of internal consent or disconsent uh, for the Kremlin, and the only official uh, statistics that we are given are what are produced by the Kremlin apparatus uh, for official release on the, after the election date. I, I, I think that's absolutely the case. And you know what else? I wouldn't be surprised if President Putin himself never actually gets to see the real results. Um, because the apparatus around him is designed and uh, to support him in the in the role of presidency, and I, I uh, he has not surrounded himself with people who are going to be critically constru critical, constructive or otherwise. He's got he's surrounded himself with people and an apparatus that is there to support him and will not divert off that. I mean, if he is, the figures he is given may not be the, what the, the actual figures. But the point here is that actually we've got two different, well, maybe three dynamics within Russian society. We've got the, the old school Russians, who uh, uh, many of whom I, I, I've, I've come to know quite well, but they are absolutely of the mind that you vote for the president because the president represents Russia, whether you like the president or whether you don't, that actually the president's going to win anyway, so we might as well vote for him. And actually, 
uh, he's actually trying to rebuild Russia and the glory and the history of Russia. You might, you might, for example, um, I've got the Union Jack behind me, but you might, uh, you might, for example, liken it to some sort of uh, old-fashioned Brits who would like to see the empire back. Um, there's a certain amount of that sort of conservatism there. They will vote for Putin. Then there will be the youth who, frankly, don't want to turn out. Most of them will not turn out. Um, and that's where we'll see the turnout figures skewed. And then, so they won't be sort of voting against him because they've got nobody to vote for. Um, he's made that very, very sort of, <laughs> sort of very clear situation. Um, and then there's going to be the other people who do vote against. And of course, the sort of, the, the, the stooges in the opposition, if you like, the two uh, candidates in the opposition who are really, they're not, they're not opposition. Um, they've not condemned the war. They've not condemned Putin. Um, they're not going to condemn the regime in any way. They are just an alternative. So there's a couple right. of other names on the ballot. So this is a total, this is total theatre, this entire thing. And, uh, you know, that's what we've got to recognise. The danger in it and this is a real significant danger, is that we will uh, allow him to... Uh, we, or we won't put the, join the dots together. This is part of Putin's effort to turn, uh, particularly with the elections in the occupied areas of Ukraine, to turn the Russian economy and society into a total war footing. He knows right. that if the West... that the West is trying to say it's in this for the long game. He's getting ahead of that. He's preparing for it politically, socially, economically and militarily. Right. Well, uh, Henry Bolton, we've uh, reached uh, the end of our time. Uh, I appreciate your words on the matter and I'd be fascinated to see those official uh, election results in comparison with the uh, with the real actual. I'd like effect. to see the real ones, yes. <laughs> and I, I think that's probably the best service we can provide in uh, trying to analyze uh, Russian elections. Henry Bolton, once again, thank you very much for joining us today. You're welcome. The international community has rallied support for Ukraine by securing financing for the purchase of large quantity of ammunition. However, there's more to the story. Additionally, meetings in Vilnius and Berlin brought over pledges as European leaders met to discuss providing aid to Kiev as it battles the Russian invasion. Czech President Petr Pavel initially announced plans to procure 800,000 rounds of artillery ammunition for Ukraine, a venture supported by an 18-country coalition spearheaded by the Czech Republic. However, it later emerged that funds had been raised by only 300,000 rounds, according to Czech Prime Minister Petr Fiala. This follows commitments from other European nations, including Germany and France, although specific financial contributions from the latter two have not been disclosed. The plan involves sourcing artillery shells from third countries, with the Czech Republic identifying available stocks that could be delivered promptly upon securing the necessary funding. On Friday, foreign ministers from the Baltic states, Ukraine and France, met in Vilnius, Lithuania, to discuss enhancing support for Ukraine. To repeat that the world will stand with Ukraine as long as it takes, it's not enough anymore. Today, in our meeting here in Vilnius, we stated clearly that we will do everything so that Ukraine wins not only defending its territory, but also the rules-based world order. They expressed support for the Czech-led ammunition purchasing initiative and acknowledged the call to action by French President Emmanuel Macron. All of us agree on one thing. We cannot risk letting Russia win in Ukraine. We cannot allow such a risk. All of us would pay an extraordinary price if this would happen. In addition to European efforts, the United States has also pledged a new military aid package for Ukraine, valued at $300 million, which includes artillery shells and ammunition for HIMARS rocket systems. At the Weimar Triangle meeting, leaders from France, Germany and Poland reiterated their unwavering support for Ukraine. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz announced a coalition of allies prepared to supply long-range weapons to Ukraine, including within Ukraine itself. Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk emphasized the urgency of delivering aid to Kiev, reflecting a unified stance among European countries against Russian advances. Ammunition is badly needed in Ukraine. And for a perspective on the short-term delivery of ammunition to Ukraine, and to explore that issue is Tomasz Dachowski joining me now, a Czech member of the European Parliament. Sir, thank you very much for joining us on Ukraine this week. Thank you very much for your invitation and 
thank you very much for your excellent analysis of uh, Russian fake election. I love your TV and your humor. Really, you, you as Polish, you are the best in this way. The air, you are absolutely right in your analysis, and I was laughing all the time. <laughs> well, we have to find we have to find a reason to be able to show it, and I think uh, trying to uh, exploit some of those. Uh, exploit definitely the, nar the narrative and, and debunk it uh, is definitely one of the things. Thank you, sir. Um, well, now we're talking about these, this Czech-led ammunition coalition. Actually, I've got a bunch of questions about that because I've seen conflicting information, um, a, a bit of conflicting information about that. So to the best of my understanding, there's about, uh, uh, the Czech Republic has identified 800,000 pieces of artillery ammunition um, in various uh, maybe non-Western aligned countries. Um, some of them uh, 122 millimeter Soviet caliber and the others are 155 NATO standard rounds. Uh, would be perfect for Ukraine um, to procure this ammunition, forget about producing it in the European Union because we all know that the, the, the bottlenecks and the, the time constraints. Um, so, so procure this ammunition. So. So where are we at right now? We have more countries joining it. Do we need money? What are the issues? We are now collecting money, but we know very well where the ammunition is. Also, we had it agreement with the third countries and I will not identify nothing because it's top secret operation of the Czech Ministry of Defense mm -hmm. with uh, together with um, with Czech government and Czech president Peter Pavel and uh, we are prepared really take this ammunition from the third country and bring it to the Ukraine in two three weeks or so it's very easy if we will have it money and we are now collecting money for the ammunition and we have it now more of then uh, for uh, 300,000 grenade, and we are now prepared to bring it, bring it with aeroplanes, this ammunition, and through the Czech Republic and Poland, send it to the Ukraine. Also, it's very easy, and we are prepared to do it in a very short time. Also, it's very important. And I can openly say that we identify more ammunition, around the world because European producers are not not prepared producing more ammunition what the Ukraine need. Also, we have to buy it from the third countries. And I think it's gonna help now uh, uh, to Ukraine survive this very difficult time. I would say it's absolutely critical um, in the absence of this big aid package coming out of the United States, it being held up with some uncertainty. Uh, I love this Czech initiative, and actually it's the smartest thing that can be done to assist Ukraine right now. Uh, if I could just ask, and I, I mean, I know that there's quite a bit of secrecy about this, but is it realistic we can expect some, some uh, significant deliveries to, to, to Ukraine soon, soon enough to make a difference uh, right now to hold the line? Absolutely, you can count that in two, three weeks, we will send it this ammunition and we have it very strong mm. cooperation with Poland. Also, Poland will help us to provide it, this ammunition to the to the Ukraine sol soldier. Also, this is really very good cooperation. And I have to say, after two years of when the war, bloody war from Russia started, uh, the Czech Polish cooperation is now amazing. We are very close. We are doing a lot of things. I think that Donald uh, Tusk made a lot of things with uh, with Germany and France. We did a lot of things, especially with the Baltic countries, um, Nordic countries, and with the South. And I think that uh, our cooperation, Czech Poland, make very strong tandem for the future. And we are two more important nations what are helping Ukraine in this war to survive this aggression. And I think that uh, it will not stop. We prepare another another help. I will not be concrete, mm -hmm. but you can really um, waiting or aspecting in three, four months another 
another initiative after this initiative will come from the Czech or maybe from the Czech Polish Polish cooperation. Great. We need all we can get. Uh, my last and final question before we run out of time here on the show. Um, as a Czech member of European Parliament, have you noticed since the full-scale Russian invasion uh, that your Western European counterparts uh, are much more considerate to your opinion and are, are more eager to listen to what you have to say uh, concerning the situation in Ukraine and, and Russian aggression? I think that now is very important, last two months, that France started to be very active. Macron completely changed his view of the war. And I think he doesn't really now uh, understand or support uh, the Russian view of the situation and uh, Russian proposal that they want any peaceful solution. Also, it's very important to continue. And I think that Western Europe will change. It's pity that Germany is not uh, still uh, with us in the group who wants really help uh, Ukraine in very short times. They don't provide towers, but I hope so that we will do our best and uh, the Councillor Scholz will change his meaning about, about the things what he will provide and send to Ukraine. Right. It's great to have uh, President Macron along for the ride. So. Uh, let's hope that he can help uh, make the push uh, change German policy as far as that's concerned. And, of course, that hopefully German will listen to the Czechs and the Poles uh, a little bit more. Thomas Zdechowski, uh, Czech MEP, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your words today. Thank you very much for your excellent work. Have a nice day. And now we are moving on. I believe we have... Just a few minutes left, and let's bring in um, my good friend Zarina Zabriski, who is in Kherson, uh, one of the most dangerous cities to reside in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, Zarina has been there for several months now. Uh, Zarina, thank you for joining us today on Ukraine This Week. Thank you, Don. It's great to speak to you, to your audience. I appreciate you bringing Kherson uh, to the global attention. Uh, I have been covering it here for six months. We're right on the front line, uh, and I can report firsthand about the situation here. Right now, as Arena, due to te technical difficulties that we had at the beginning of the program, we have last time right now. Um, so I guess uh, I wanted to show your video and get into more detail, but we really only have about a minute and a half left. So if you could please just talk to us about uh, the situation in Kherson as you're experiencing it on a daily basis. Uh, yes, very briefly, uh, this is the city uh, that has been occupied for nine months and the Russian troops are now located on the other side of the Dnipro River and they are attacking the city and the region on the right bank of the Dnipro on an hourly basis. They use all arsenal of weapons available to them, anything from aerial bombs to missiles and to drones, mortar, tanks, uh, we hear Kalashnikovs. Um, uh, th there's not uh, two hours that would pass without explosions. As a result, the city is being badly damaged. Uh, the day before yesterday, our apartment uh, was hit. It is the second time that our part of the building is hit, and that pretty much is the story for every building around here. Uh, uh, on the other hand, this situation is severely underreported, always pushed over the table. Even in Ukraine, people do not know to the full extent the crisis uh, that is going on here. That adds to the echo side uh, after the flood that happened in June, and of course, nine months of the horrors and torture and the war crimes that Russia right. have imposed on the region. Right. Well, Zarina, we've run out of time. I'm sorry I couldn't have you on longer, but thank you for joining us on Ukraine this week, and we'll definitely connect with you, hopefully again very soon. Thank you, Zarina. Thank you, Don. And that concludes this edition of Ukraine This Week, our first edition. Of course, a few issues along the way, but uh, please tune in every Saturday over the weekends on demand to our website uh, for your one-stop shop for information regarding Ukraine, Ukraine This Week. Thank you.